Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Paul Gianfrido, who is the president and CEO of Mental Health America. And he's really been a leader. Oh, I have to keep the microphone, yes. Uh, he's really been a leader in health and mental health for over 30 years. Um, he began as a legislator, and you correct me if I get any of this wrong, okay. <laughs> um, as a legislator in Connecticut where he actually was part of key committees there, including chairing a um, committee on public health, which I think is really great, um, and served in that capacity for quite some time. He then also was mayor of Middletown, Connecticut. Um, at that point, then, he took over doing consulting work for many years and then has helped to lead nonprofits in the health and mental health sector before coming on as the president of Mental Health America. Um, he's also a speaker and a writer, uh, and one of his essays a achieved a, a lot of attention and then became a book. Um, and the book is about, and I I'll get the title right because I might misspay it because the essay and the book have different titles. Right. <laughs> um, but the book was Losing Tim, How Our Health and Education Systems Failed My Son with Schizophrenia. And so you can see he has multiple perspectives to the work that, that he does and that we do. Um, he's also an adjunct faculty member at Wesleyan and Trinity Colleges where um, he teaches policy. Um, and I wanted to say just a little bit about Mental Health America. I'm hoping you hear a lot more from him about this, but I think it's um, really apropos to think about a uh, community, nonprofit community run organization or community organization um, that thinks not only about treatment but about prevention in all aspects uh, of mental health care and um, and it actually predates us. This is a centennial event but they were founded in 1909 so before <laughs> the Bloomberg School of Public Health um, and they have I think over 200 affiliates across the country in over 40 states um, with many, many employees associated with those affiliates and many more volunteers beyond that. And so we were very eager that he agreed to come and speak with us today. And so thank you again for coming for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here with you. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to spend some time with you and to do this presentation. Um, I've been doing it a lot, frankly, around the country lately, and um, it's a, always, for, for me, a pleasure to get to different places and to have different groups of people hear some of this and begin to think through with me uh, the perspectives that we've been gaining over the course, um, really, uh, of recent years, but, but perspectives that I think have been building over the course of the last generation or two about how we can uh, really use many of the principles of public health to do a much better job of thinking about the mental health problems that are confounding society right now and doing a much better job of dealing with those. So in the course of this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Mental Health America. I'm going to talk a little bit about my son, Tim, and the book. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my background, some of the things I've done. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, some of the new and kind of interesting things we're learning at Mental Health America as we learn more and more about uh, the constituencies that we serve. So as you heard, Mental Health America uh, was founded more than a century ago, just like you all were, uh, by Clifford Beers, a person from Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, as a mental hygiene movement, really, in founding Mental Health America, uh, which was called then the Committee on Mental Hygiene, uh, really had himself something of a perspective uh, that we'd say would fit squarely and solidly into the public health uh, world. He himself was a, a peer or a consumer or a patient. People use different words, and many of them uh, cause offense for various constituencies. But he himself uh, had been institutionalized in Connecticut, had come out of the institution and said, in effect, this is a horrible thing. As he said, we quote, I must fight in the open, and really began this movement to try to have us transition care from the kinds of really custodial care and worse than custodial care that people were getting in our public institutions and out into the communities. Uh, we, for most of our history, were the National Mental Health Association, but about 10 years ago, uh, rebranded ourselves as Mental Health America. Uh, half of our 200 affiliates around the country still refer to themselves as the Mental Health Association of either a state or a county generally. The other half are Mental Health America of generally either a state 
um, or the county. And while we've only got 20 people working in our national office, collectively our budgets total about $300 million and there are about 6,000 uh, employees who are working for MHA or MHA affiliates around the country in 41 different states in DC. Um, about a century ago also, um, I, like a number of other people, took <laughs> office in the Connecticut uh, General Assembly. And what I tell people is uh, this, that when I got to the state legislature, um, I managed because I had a friend to get on a very good committee in Connecticut, which was the Appropriations Committee. And the Appropriations Committee is the most powerful committee in, in Connecticut. And, and in Connecticut State Legislature, all the committees are joint committees. So the House and the Senate members serve on the committee together. Uh, but the Appropriations Committee was also not a very exclusive committee. There were 187 members. Uh, 40 set, 44 of us got to serve on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and, but because it was a consequential committee, handled all the budgets for all the state, all the work was divided among 11 subcommittees. And the chair people called each of us in to ask us what subcommittee choices we'd like to have. And so I was called in before them and uh, asked that question. I'd thought about it and I was prepared. And I said, okay, um, I have recently gotten out of school. I went to Wesleyan University. I graduated three years ago. I think I know something about education. So I'd like to be on the education subcommittee. And I've been playing my accordion at nursing homes for the last 10 years. And uh, elderly people in nursing homes go hand in glove. And so I think I know something about uh, the elder community and feel some affection toward that. The Human Services Subcommittee deals with issues affecting elders. So I'd like to be on the Human Services Subcommittee. And finally, I'm an anti-nuclear activist, I told them. I've been working against nuclear power, pro-solar, pro-wind, pro-energy conservation. And the Regulated Activities Subcommittee deals with that, so I'd also like to be on the Regulated Activities Subcommittee. They looked at me and they said, you're going to do health. <laughs> and I looked back at them and I said, I don't want to do health. And they looked at me and they said, neither does anybody else. You're going to do health. So six weeks into my legislative career at the age of 25, with absolutely no background in health, I'd been a philosophy major in college, taking only philosophy, religion, Latin, Greek, and English uh, courses during my time in college, I was now at 25 years old, the legislature's go-to person on all matters related to health, uh, mental health, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, addiction disorders, and veterans affairs, because <laughs> we had no place else to put veterans affairs. Nobody wanted to do that either. So needless to say, it was like being dropped into the deep end of the pool uh, without knowing how to swim. And I had to figure out how to swim. What I knew about mental health in those days uh, was that I had played my accordion one time at Connecticut Valley Hospital in Middletown, Connecticut, one of the three large state uh, psychiatric hospitals in Connecticut at that time. What I knew about public health was absolutely nothing. And, uh, and in fact, the very first things I began to learn about public health, I learned primarily because uh, there was a, a display of the WIC program, Women's Infants and Children's Program, in the state capitol. And there were two WIC nutritionists from the Department of Health Services, Department of Public Health in those days in, in the state of Connecticut who were there. And they were about my age and they were cute. And I went up and I talked to them <laughs> and, uh, and they said, oh, you know, you're a legislator. And I said, oh, you work for the health department. And they're like, yeah. And they said, you should put some money into nutrition education. So the very first thing I did in public health was add four <laughs> positions, four more positions to the uh, nutrition area, which was not on the list of 12 priorities that our state health commissioner had at that time. And um, so actually in response to that, he, and he is actually still to this day a very good friend of mine, and, uh, but he, he put out an edict at that time and said, look, you know, we're, we're, you know, if you want to talk to state legislators, you know, you got to work through our legislative liaison and you got to work on that. But of course, we state legislators found out about that. And so our response to that, one of the people on my subcommittee, in fact, said, look, she was a, a nurse who had been a retired nurse. She was in her 70s at the time. And she said, you know, I used to babysit for that health commissioner uh, back when he was a little baby. And I'll tell you, the one thing he most cares about is his out-of-state travel. So I think we can send him a message back that anybody can talk to us who wants to any time if we just uh, tell him we're going to take all his out-of-state travel away. So we went back and we took all the out-of-state travel out of the budget. We got our nutritionists. They remained in the budget. Uh, we, he got his out-of-state travel back as part of the compromise. And I was on in my, my career as a public health professional 
basically working on policy. Well, you know, while a lot of interesting things happened as a result of that, the truth was that in looking at mental health at that time in particular, and looking at health, what happened in 1980, right after I got in there and took over this, was Ronald Reagan got elected. And Ronald Reagan brought with him the new federalism. And when the new federalism came, the Community Mental Health Centers Act funding went out the door. And block grant funding came in from the federal government. And so those block grants were handed to state legislators like me to try to figure out how we were going to use the federal dollars to build systems of care. Now, you might think I was fairly unique in being absolutely naive and uninformed about any matters related to health or public health in those days as a policymaker, but I was fairly well the norm, a norm that exists to this day in many state legislatures around the country. I tried at least to learn on the job, and through most of the 1980s, I spent a lot of time in D.C., uh, because at that time, the National Center for Health Services Research, which is now AHRQ, that agency, had a program for state policymakers and public officials because they wanted us to become better informed in the decision making that we were doing. They called it the user liaison program. Uh, when we brought our bags into the um, airports, when we would travel for the user liaison program, most people thought we were a, a drug treatment uh, organization at that point um, because, because of that. But what happened was with the user liaison program, we would bring in health services researchers and they would talk to us and they would tell us what it was they were going to present to policymakers, And then we would critique that so that they would actually be able to go and, and speak to them in language those policymakers could understand so those policymakers could use health services research to make more informed decisions. Well, at one point, I was there with a friend of mine who's a state legislator from Michigan. And he also served on the Appropriations Committee. And we were rehearsing this, this um, actually very well regarded uh, researcher. And the researcher went through his 45-minute presentation with all of the transparencies that we used in those days. That's what we called PowerPoint. And uh, we called it transparency. He had all his transparencies. We went through all of that stuff. And at the end of the 45 minutes, he said, so how did I do? How is this? And my friend from Michigan looked at him and said, you know, that was very good. And there's a lot of useful information there. But I got to tell you, when I get back to Michigan, I'm going to have to be able to explain this to a plumber. And the guy said, OK, I understand what you're saying. When you get back to Michigan, you've got to explain this to ordinary people, to regular constituents who need to understand why it is you're going to be investing in this area. He said, no, you don't understand. The chairperson of my public health committee is a plumber. I've got to be able to explain this to a plumber when I get back. So if you consider the uh, people fresh out of college and the plumbers who were doing a lot of health and mental health policy in the 1980s, it would be no uh, accident or no misunderstanding or mistake uh, to come to the conclusion that perhaps we didn't have an entirely good picture of what it was we were doing, and perhaps we were going to make a few mistakes. And when it came to moving people from institutions into the community, we actually made more than a few mistakes. But the biggest ones, the biggest ones that we made are, were the ones that I, I mentioned here. The first one was that we didn't understand that we needed to stop waiting for crises before we took action. For too long, we, would, we managed to move policy in a direction which was where it was only responsive to the crisis of the day. What we used to call it in the health side was the disease of the month club. And if something came to us and that was the one that was getting attention in those days, that was the one to which we would give our attention. You know, in the 1980s when I was in the state legislature, I like to tell people three different significant and consequential diseases were effectively discovered and or described during the 1980s for policymakers for the first time. One of them was post-traumatic stress disorder, which the Vietnam veterans brought to us as a cause and said, you need to do something about this. It's not just shell shock. Another one was HIV AIDS, which was discovered at that time and became a huge issue for us to deal with at that time. And a third one in Connecticut was actually Lyme disease. Uh, which was discovered and described at that time and named after one of the communities not far from my district. And I remember on that one, uh, we who were fairly naive but really uh, working hard at trying to get attention for this, uh, once developed a petition drive to get our governor at that time, Bill O'Neill, to put some dollars into our state health budget so that we could do something meaningful around Lyme disease. Not waiting just for crises to act, but that was the crisis of the day. And we had this petition signed by more than 10,000 people 
that we had circulated. And we had all of those signed petitions through the Public Health Committee brought to the governor's office, and the governor looked at those petitions, and he agreed on the basis of all of that and our interest as well to put some money into the budget to fight Lyme disease. It wasn't until after we had delivered those petitions to him that I actually took a moment to look at what we had said in there. And we had unfortunately and inadvertently left out a single word in the petition. And so we had informed our governor that rather than Lyme disease, which was consequential and there were a lot of cases in Connecticut at that time, being caused by the bite of a deer tick, we had left off the word tick and had told the governor it was caused by the bite of a deer. Thousands of people in Connecticut were suffering from the ill effects of the bites of deer, but that crisis was sufficient to get us to start putting money into Lyme disease. We had to stop waiting for crises to act, though, because they were much more serious on the mental health side, the behavioral health side, and I'll get more to that uh, later on. We didn't understand. We needed to focus as much as we did on prevention and early intervention. The problem we had, and transparencies was one of the best way to describe this, when we were dealing with any matters related to public health, was that what happened when we focused in on prevention? Well, what happened, the way I used to do it in presentations at that time, I just have a blank transparency. When prevention worked, nothing happened. Well, how do you get nothing happening from nothing happening to getting investment on the part of policymakers? We didn't figure out how to do that at that time, and we didn't understand particularly in the area of behavioral health, that we were going to have to invest more, not less. As we had begun to suck the dollars and suck the support out of those state psychiatric hospitals, we hadn't put any dollars into it. So they were merely, in the 1980s, custodial care institutions for the most part. There were some individuals doing really remarkable stuff, but in general, that's all they were. And those custodial care institutions were so grossly underfunded that when we began to close those down, and we thought that we would be able to put less money into the communities, it turned out we were wrong. We were going to need to invest more, not less. Now, what we ended up creating as a result of all of this was what I call chains of neglect. And they ended up affecting me at a personal level in a way I never at that time anticipated they would. Five years, six years into my legislative career, my son Tim came along. I adopted him at the age of seven weeks. He's a great little kid. But at about the age of five years old, he began to show signs of what would be eventually diagnosed as schizophrenia when he was 16. Now, that's pretty typical. You know, about 10 years passed from the time symptoms of mental illness emerged to the time that we get a final diagnosis and the right treatment. Also fairly typical is the fact that those symptoms of mental illness emerge during childhood. Half of all mental illnesses emerge by the age of 14, three quarters by the age of 25, notwithstanding the myth that these are primarily conditions that first manifest when people are in their early 20s to mid 20s. So what we needed to do and what we never did was understand that mental illnesses, for the most part, were diseases of childhood. And we needed to think about them as diseases of childhood. And we needed to intervene while people were children in order to make certain that we could change trajectories of lives and make certain that they would have the most positive outcomes. Well, we failed to do that because we didn't understand when we were deinstitutionalizing in the 1980s that while the people who were coming out of those institutions looked a lot like the people in this room, a mix of ages, mostly adults, all of that, we didn't understand that the people who had been going into those institutions and into our public mental health system were kids at that time and teenagers at that time. And that's why we needed to invest heavily there. So when we failed to do that, when we failed to take educational systems and make them part of the treatment plans and treatment systems that would help kids to survive and thrive, when we failed to take community-based services and supports and use those to wrap around families and neighborhoods to make sure that they could, could keep these kids healthy and thriving. When we failed to take into account into our treatment systems that we were going to have to invest heavily in those years that, that occur before the crisis stages occur, before first psychotic break, as in the case of my son, before those tragedies begin to occur. We didn't understand all of that. What we ended up doing was neglecting our kids, and what we ended up doing was neglecting our mental health problems. Now, in Tim's case, I tell people, they say to me, well, how did you know? You know, what did you see you know, that said to you, this, this kid's got schizophrenia? 
when he's five years old or six years old because it's not typical to be diagnosed. And, it, and he was diagnosed retrospectively at the age of 16 as childhood onset. And I said, you know, I really can't tell you because it's like any other chronic disease. The symptoms kind of come on over time. They kind of catch up with you over time. And, but I can tell you that, you know, the day when he was six years old and went down and lay down in the middle of the street just to see if a car would run him over, um, that was a time I knew that it was beyond normal risk taking that what my son was doing. And when you couple that with the fact that he was having difficulty sleeping, he was having difficulty with friendship formation, he was having difficulty attending to his teacher and, and with focus and concentration, but he wasn't hyperactive. When he was having difficulty, he would just go off to the corner once in a while in his classroom and, uh, and, and not be able to participate in what was going on. When you put all those things together, it was clear we were at a time when we could have intervened, should have intervened, should have recognized what was going on, and should have moved to change the trajectory of Tim's life. Instead, what happened is what typically happens with kids who begin to show signs and symptoms of mental illnesses and serious mental illnesses at that. We waited three years before we could get him into special education services. It took that long because it typically takes that long to intervene with kids and get them the special education services they need in order to thrive and survive in school. And in many school districts around the country today, it still takes kids getting two years behind grade level before they'll be admitted to special education services at all. Now I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here. If you let a kid with serious mental illness get two years behind grade level before you start providing the compensatory services he or she needs in order to survive, he, is she, he or she is never going to catch up. And in Tim's case, he never caught up. The last year that Tim actually spent a full year in school, uh, and from, from start to finish in a regular year, and entering that grade in August or September, going out in, in April, May, or June, that was fifth grade for Tim. After that, most of what happened to Tim was discontinuous, miscoordinated care with a lot of suspensions, a lot of expulsions in all kinds of schools. Now, what we typically do, which is very different from what we've done historically with a lot of public health, other kinds of public health problems, is we go right to blaming the individual. Now, in the rest of public health, this is talking about individual risk factors right, that people have. But in the rest of public health, we also talk about community risk factors that exist. Well, on the behavioral health side, what we typically do is simply blame the people who've got the condition because after all, it's bad behavior. That's how it's manifesting. It's a behavioral health condition. And so we say, as Tim was often told, all you have to do, son, is follow the rules, his sixth grade principal said, and he'll be fine. We're saying, well, he can't just follow the rules. He can't just do everything that everybody else does without support. So he's not going to be fine. And they're saying, well, like with a lot of kids with mental health concerns, with a lot of adults with mental health issues, people will say, just get over it. You got depression, just get over it. Feel a little better. Be happy. Try smiling. Do things like that. We blame the individual instead of thinking about it as we would think about any other chronic condition. Imagine telling somebody who was just diagnosed with cancer, just don't think about it. Smile a little bit more and it'll go away. They don't and it doesn't go away. And when we stop blaming the kids, what we frequently do in the area of behavioral health is blame the parents. One of the experiences that I had um, that really helps to illuminate this and is a very common experience for a lot of parents occurred when we were in due process to try to get Tim's individualized education program put into place in sixth grade because the principal and the school district were dragging their heels. And we got to due process, and at that point, Tim was already 11 years old. And Tim had already had his first psychotic break. Tim had already strapped down rollerblades and tried to rollerblade down the middle of a busy state highway in the middle of winter in his underwear. Uh, Tim had already uh, tried to uh, take his life by suicide by, by, by taking an, and, and drinking an excess of mouthwash at the time is what he did. He had already tried to take his life again by jumping out of the car uh, while we were in the middle of, a, of, of Interstate 95 going 65 miles an hour. All of those things that happened. He had already been hospitalized. Um, he had already been, been given mental health diagnosis. He had already had multiple, multiple evaluations that were educational evaluations, multiple clinical evaluations. And when asked under oath, what of all of those things and all of those diagnoses the school district thought was Tim's biggest problem 
at that time. His special education teacher, answering on behalf of the school district under oath, said two words, overprotective parents. And that is so typical for what so many people have, 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 have experienced in this area because we haven't thought about behavioral health conditions the way you think about them here. We haven't thought about behavioral health conditions as being very much like other health conditions that affect people. We haven't thought about building behavioral health systems in the same way we build public health systems. No, we've turned these things into behavioral issues. We've turned these things, therefore, into public safety issues. We've turned these things, therefore, into the kinds of responses that not only make certain that kids won't survive and thrive, but in fact lead kids in precisely the opposite direction, are for themselves responsible as what I would call among the community risk factors that help kids become less healthy as adults, that help kids become less surviving as adults, help kids thrive less when they become adults, much like Tim today, who at the age of 35, or 30 years old, 25 years into a serious mental health condition, is homeless on the streets of San Francisco. Not in the revolving door that we had in the mid-1980s when I was a state legislator, which was the revolving door of when we moved people out of state hospitals because we had no community-based services. They simply went through the revolving door and back into our state hospitals again. No, it's the revolving door that we've created for 2015, which is a door that revolves among infrequent hospitalization, frequent incarceration, and chronic homelessness for so many people like Tim. And that's the problem we need to solve. It's not a problem that's caused by people like Tim. It's the problem that captures people like Tim because of the policy decisions that we've made that have been inappropriate and just wrong-headed. Now, those are the kinds of seeds we planted in the 1980s. And the problem with the current mental health landscape is that it's no better today as a matter of public policy. If anything, it's gotten worse. Now, we could say in the 1980s that we were naive. We didn't understand that those people going into the system were kids and the people coming out were adults. We didn't understand what it was we were gonna have to do to build community-based systems of care and support. We didn't understand the effect of trauma on mental illness because we hadn't heard of post-traumatic stress disorder at that time. There was so much we didn't understand that we could at least say 30 years ago, we had no idea what we were doing and had no idea what we're talking about. Today, we understand all of this. And so the policymakers to today, despite understanding all of this, compound all of those mistakes we made. Do you know they cut $4.6 billion from state mental health budgets between 2009 and 2013. One idea about how much $4.6 billion is actually worth, the entirety of the remaining federal budget and the entirety of SAMHSA the agency that provides all the black, black grant funding and most of the other block grants to states and to local um, nonprofits to do mental health services, the entirety of the mental health budget in SAMHSA is $1.2 billion. States in five years cut four times that amount from those budgets of the entire state budget or entire federal budget for mental health. Many people will say, but don't forget, there's an NIMH too. And the federal government puts a lot of money into NIMH. All right, let's throw those dollars in also. There's another 1.2 billion for you. So now we got two and a half billion dollars being spent by the federal government in total every year, over against states that have cut 4.6 billion in five years alone. The base today is two and a half billion dollars less than the base was five years ago. The Medicaid expansion gap that exist and will persist in 20 states that haven't expanded Medicaid will disproportionately affect adults with mental illnesses. And serious mental illnesses, as I said, were frequently diseases of childhood. But I want to show you a little bit about children right now and how little they receive the kinds of integrated services today that they need. Take a look at these data, because I know here we are at a university and you have to look at data. 389,000 kids ages three to 21, kids to me, but some young adults, received special education services in 1991 on the basis of an SED label, which is the label the education system uses for serious mental illness, 389,000 kids. 
In 2013, we're down to 362,000 children. And if you look at what's happened in the trajectory here, here's basically what we've had over the course of the last several years, bringing us to 2013. Back here, one child in every 22 who had an NIMH definition, a serious mental illness or mental health concern up to the age of 21, only one child in every 22 was being identified for special education services as on the basis of that particular chronic condition or disease that they had, one in 22. The next year it was one in 23. The year after that it was one in 24. The year after that, one in 25. The year after that, one in 26. The year after that, one in 27, up till the most recent year where it's now one in 28, the lowest in 20 plus years. One child in 28. 27 out of 28 who have a serious mental health concern are never in the course of their school careers even identified as having a serious mental health concern. And we wonder, we wonder why it is that when tragedies happen and crisis events occur, we look around and say, well, how come nobody picked up on that when they were kids? Because we were ignoring it. Why were we ignoring it? Because the federal government created a special education mandate and then underfunded it. And then the state governments left to fund it, decided also then to underfund it, to stick it back to the federal government because they said it's your mandate, you don't fund it, we're not going to fund it either. And therefore it got left to local school districts who listening to the taxpayers who say don't raise my property taxes, say federal government you're not funding it, state government you're not funding it. Therefore despite a legal entitlement that these kids have to special education services, we're simply going to ignore the condition. We're not going to recognize it, and therefore, we don't have to get involved in treating the condition. So all three levels of government have punted. Well, it's not like there's not a consequence related to this, because not having done what's necessary for adults or for children with mental health conditions simply leads us to a whole other set of circumstances, such as the fact that homelessness persists in a way today that it did not persist in 1979 when I took office. We did not have this problem that we've got today around homelessness, but a third of the people who have chronic homelessness or are chronically homeless have serious mental illnesses. 40% alcohol dependency, 26% drug dependency. You add them all together, really it's more than half. It's well more than half who have got one or more of these conditions. And hospitalization, by the way, has become the norm. We may have closed a lot of state psychiatric hospitals, but you know the leading reason why any of us up to the age of 45 go into the hospital, not the emergency room, but hospital inpatient care other than to give birth or be born, it's mood disorders. And finally, incarceration is commonplace. What we have done in our society is we haven't closed our state custodial care institutions. We just shut the doors of one kind of a state in custodial care institution that we called a state psychiatric hospital, and we've opened the doors to another kind of custodial care institution that we call our jails and our prisons. Timothy's two most common addresses in the course of his adult lifetime that he has had have been the Travis County Jail and the San Francisco County Jail. And those are the places we most frequently find him when we are able to find him because he is otherwise most frequently homelessness. But 6% of the overall population you know, has a serious mental illness. But just looking at the prison population, now that as opposed to the jail population, that's where the serious offenders go. That's where the, the sentence is more than six months to a year. That's where those people go. Those are the facilities run by the states or the federal government. 15% of men in prison have a serious mental illness. 31% of women in prison have a serious mental illness. This isn't just a problem that affects young men like Tim. This is a problem that more frequently affects young women. And how come it affects us this way? Well, it's for this one very simple reason. Mental health conditions are the only chronic conditions that as a matter of public policy, by applying a danger to self or other standard for as a trigger to treatment, that we wait until stage four to treat. And then often, only through incarceration. At Mental Health America, we say we need to act before stage four because that's the way we handle every other chronic disease or chronic condition in America, and that's the way we need to be thinking about and handling mental health conditions as well. 
It fits so nicely, not only into a public health framework, it fits nicely into a chronic disease framework as well. And it allows us to move the attention of people upstream, away from post-crisis intervention to places where it will actually make a difference. You won't believe this, but the fact of the matter is, for so much of the, the recent history of, pub, of mental health policy, behavioral health policy, policymakers have really thought that there were two different kinds of people who had mental health concerns. There were people over here that had serious mental illnesses. We had to be concerned about those people. And then there were people over here who were so-called worried well, and we didn't really need to be, as a matter of public policy, all that concerned about them. What we're here to say is, the people here and the people here are the same people. It's just these people are 10 years earlier in a disease process for the most part. And we think that through our before stage four campaign, we're finding them. Well, here's how. Because before stage four for us ties to our overall work. And for us, that means prevention for all, early identification and intervention for those at risk, integrated health, behavioral health, and other services like educational services for people who need them as recovery as a goal. And about a year or so, a year and a half ago, we launched an online screening program called mhascreening.org that's the linchpin of some of our early intervention efforts that fits right in there, in that wheelhouse, sort of right between prevention and early intervention. We put these tools online. And the reason we did it was because we want to interrupt the progression of disease. If you take this four-step model, this four-step staging model, that all the other conditions are taking these days that we understand so well for those and say, if you can interrupt it at stage one, instead of having to move downstream, upstream, you can kick a person out of there back to recovery and back to wellness, just the same way we think about people who are diagnosed with cancer. Let's catch it at stage one. Recovery's easier, it's simpler, it's less expensive, it's more effective at that stage than if we wait till stage four with cancer, and yet we have historically waited till stage four with behavioral health conditions, then wondered why it was. We had such difficulty in moving people toward recovery. What did we think would happen? So screening tools are a way to move everybody's attention upstream. These are the nine that we have on our website at this point. Four of them, depression, anxiety, bipolar, and PTSD, we've had up since May of last year. The others we added in May of this year. And I just want to show you something about who's screening because I think you'll get a kick out of this. Three quarters of the people who come to our screening site are female. And at the beginning, when we started doing screening, we had no idea what we were gonna get. About 1,000 screens a day were completed. Now we're getting about 3,000 screens a day being completed nationwide on this. So we've got more than 650,000 that we've analyzed at this point. Women are simply more attuned to their mental health concerns than young men are. 31% of the people who are screening are non-white. 66%, two-thirds, screen as positive or moderate to severe for the condition for which they screen. Two-thirds. They're not just worried well. They're people who are starting down a pathway that we need to interrupt, we need to deflect, we need to move as quickly as we can. But of those two-thirds of the people, of the two-thirds who are screening as positive or moderate to severe, Two-thirds of those people are telling us they have never been diagnosed. So for the very first time, we're getting a picture of a population, we understand it's an opportunity sample, who are in the first stages of being worried about their mental health, and they're telling us something about them themselves and telling us what they're worried about. So here's some of the information that we've gotten. Uh, the donut there, the most important thing to look at of all the data here, and you can see there's about 400,000 unduplicated screeners who are included here. The green is all under the age of 25. So right now we're getting about two thirds almost, 60% of the people who are screening, either between the ages of 11 and 17 or 18 and 24. These are diseases of childhood that affect people 50% of the time before the age of 14. It stands to reason that people between the ages of 11 and 17 are not only gonna be worried about their mental health, but are gonna be justifiably worried about their mental health. And this is really myth-busting for another reason, because a lot of people think, especially with serious mental illnesses, right, that people have anosognosia, that people don't understand, they have no lack insight into the fact that they're different, they've got an illness. 
What we're seeing in the earliest stages of all of the conditions is people don't lack insight. They might lack information. They might lack an opportunity about knowing where to go, but they certainly don't lack insight. They certainly got a lot of that and a lot of worry about what's going on. Um, just a breakdown by race and ethnicity suggests that we're getting significant numbers of people from traditionally minority communities, enough, by the way, to allow us to run some analyses that I'll show you now in a minute. Uh, the percent positive, most of the people who take our screens, 58% screen for depression. And again, two-thirds of the people to three-quarters who take the depression screening, the PHQ-9, fit within the moderate to severe uh, range there. And, uh, but we're also getting a significant number of positives around anxiety, some PTSD, and some bipolar. But the blue there uh, are the depression numbers. And here's the one on psychosis. All those people who lack insight, we looked at 2,500 who screened between May and August of this year. 95% of them screened at risk. They themselves are taking, choosing to take this screen. They are getting the information that they're at risk. We think we are seeing people who are at undiagnosed, remember, two-thirds of them, at stage one of the psychosis process, many of them long before they have had a psychotic break, long before they will have a psychotic break. Three-quarters of the people who take the substance use disorder screen are screening as positive, based on about 3,000 in that time frame. Multiracial individuals, when we look at this demographically, are those who are the mo have the greatest percentage of people who are coming up as positive or in the moderate to severe range. Again, based on about 250,000 people total, when we split it out, 80% of people who were multiracial were coming out as positive. People who ID as, self-identify as LGBT, that's according to CDC in 2013, 2.3% of the population as a whole. This is self-identifying. People who are taking our screening who self-identify as LGBT 10 times. Uh, that number. So clearly, many more significant mental health concerns uh, for people in that historically minority population. Children in mental illness, we're seeing the warning signs. Those 11 to 17 year olds, 36,000 of them taking a screen between May and July. And we took a look at that. 80% of them who took the youth screen, that's the only one normed for them, validated for youth, screened as moderate or screened as positive or at risk. But take a look at how many are actually taking the depression screening. They've already gone beyond just wondering whether they're at risk of something to specifically choosing the screen that they think they need to take and taking those screens. And even earlier warning signs, are we really finding people upstream? The parent screening, which is used that parents can use with their young kids, 62% of them are screening at risk, 38% only not at risk. So we are absolutely convinced we're finding people at the earliest stages. Well, what are we seeing them as positive for? Caregivers. We ask people about caregiver status. Caregivers are most frequently positive for PTSD and depression. Most people thought it would be anxiety that we'd be looking at there. It's not. Veterans and active duty people. You know, all of our programs are built around PTSD for our veteran and active duty population. He asked veterans and active duty people what it is they're most concerned about is depression. There are different strategies dealing with depression than dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. If we put all of our resources into PTSD with veterans, we're making a mistake because they're telling us they need something else. Well, who would be most concerned about post-traumatic stress disorder? Turns out it's students uh, that are giving us the most positives there. Now, here's something else that we think is myth-busting in this that people need to understand. And that is we're often told that the African-American community is the least likely to want to have this information do something with these results. What we're discovering is they're the most likely. Only 30% of them tell us they're going to do absolutely nothing with the results. Look at the Asian Pacific Islander population. 45% of them tell us they're going to do absolutely nothing with the results, no matter how positive they are. And remember. Two-thirds of these people are coming out positive. Men are more likely than women. Not only are they less likely to screen, they're more likely to say they're going to do nothing uh, than women are uh, based on, again, those results of about a quarter of a million people. 14% of the people screening have other chronic conditions. Now, you may think that's a pretty small number because we understand that comorbidities exist. But remember, we have most of our screeners in the 11 to 25-year-old age group what time at which many of the chronic conditions will not have emerged yet. But when they do tell us they've got them, 
The one they most frequently say they've got is chronic pain. We've also got a lot of people with lung disease, diabetes, um, heart disease, and, and other conditions as well. So how does that work so from the other perspective? Well, people who are taking our screen who report having chronic pain, 77% of them, among 10,000 who took the screen, are also positive or in the moderate to severe range for a mental health condition. For those who have lung disease, 4,000 took the screen during the period of time that we were looking at, 80% of them positive for a mental health condition. People with diabetes, comorbidities, 74% of 4,000 people comorbid for a mental health condition. So what do people want? They want help, but what they need is integrated care. What they need is integrative services. What they need and are telling us is, we need to stop looking at an individual on the basis of one set of presenting symptoms at a time and begin to look at individuals as a whole and then to draw us to looking at communities as a whole. Also to look at the risk factors that are present in those communities, to look at the risk factors that are present in those households, and then also to begin to look at the risk factors that may be present in those individuals. But what we have done, therefore, with our screening advocacy is really tied this, in many respects, to a public health approach. That mental health screening, we are now articulating, needs to be advanced in policy. It's one of those things that moves us upstream. We need to be moved upstream. We need to think about this as a health condition. We need our public policy to catch up with that. We need our public policy to stop taking people who've got substance use disorders and mental health conditions and criminalizing their behaviors on the basis of those disorders that they have. We need them to start acknowledging that it is no more just or right to criminalize that condition than it would be to criminalize cancer. And many people use this parallel. Imagine taking somebody who is at stage four cancer, who is resistant to treatment, and saying to them, so what I'm gonna do is throw you in jail until you agree to treatment for your stage four cancer. We would not think of doing that as a society, and yet we do it every single day for people who are at stage four of a behavioral illness, stage four of a mental illness, or a substance use disorder. We need to change our policies, the policies that have brought Tim to where he is today, that have brought many people like Tim to where they are today. In addition, all of this should be ecological. In our minds, screening ought to be as commonplace as vision, hearing, and dental screening for kids. It ought to be as commonplace as blood pressure screening for adults. This is not Rorschach testing. This is not out there science that nobody can quite figure out. These are simple questionnaires that people can fill out all the time. One of the things we tell people who screen online is just print out the results or keep the results and take them and begin a conversation with your clinician the next time you see him, with a family member when you're talking to them, with a peer if you're talking to them, but start thinking about it and, and worrying over it the same way you might worry over your blood pressure results as they begin to tick up just a little bit. And what we're saying to people also that we eventually hope will happen is that when we're all sitting in those doctor's offices that, you know, and we're waiting for that appointment to come, to take the screening then. So you walk right in with the results and say, this is what I'm feeling today. And for our kids, we think screening ought to be ubiquitous in our schools. After all, it's affecting learning to have serious mental health conditions that go untreated, that go underreported, that, that are misidentified or underidentified. And so we think catching things early and moving things upstream in the mental health side, as you all do, should be ecological. It leads, should lead to structural change. In other words, it ought to be conducted everywhere clinicians' offices, community schools, and workplaces. And this is just one of the initiatives that we would do. And it also should inform both the reduction of community risk factors, like poor economic opportunity, as well as individual risk factors, like self-harm and neglect, and not be confined simply to the individual and to the individual risk factors. As some folks from um, this institution and related to this institution have said, we need to move beyond a focus only on changing the pathology within an individual. Rather, we must attend to the structural, economic, policy, and ecological factors that contribute to the onset and persistence of behavioral disorders. So we applaud you all for being very much in line with our before stage four thinking. You know, we applaud this institution for thinking 100 years ago that behavioral health 
and, and public health were going to be intertwined. And for, for really having the only program like this in the country, as Emory has the only, an, the only other program that, that focuses significantly on behavioral health in the country, well before many other uh, have figured out, many others have figured out the absolutely critical need to integrate not just the services and the treatment they, we provide, but to integrate our thinking around health and behavioral health. Because you see, if we do that and we start moving from thinking about behavioral health conditions as be bad behaviors and thinking about addressing those within a criminal justice system, if we begin to change our perspective from thinking about, from using sheriffs where we're supposed to be using emergency medical technicians to respond to crises, from using courtrooms instead of hospital ERs as, as, as points of, of entry into the system, of using jails and prisons as opposed to clinical services as the, as the locus of care and services and treatment for people. If we begin to, way, to change the way we think, to think about mental health and behavioral health concerns in general, in the very same way we think about other kinds of health concerns, then we will make a difference. We will change the society that we, we are in. We will change the trajectories of lives like Tim. We will make certain that we assure that people not only survive but thrive. We will move to re-engage people. We will move people from treatment to recovery. We will manage to prevent bad things from occurring in the future. We will manage to make for a healthier and happier and more productive society. And when we do all of those things, we will be thanked for that. So I thank you all for your time and attention. And uh, Tim, I think, thanks us all uh, for thinking about him and thinking about people like him. So I don't know if you got any questions. I know I'm about at my time right now. Uh, or comments, but thanks.